Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today we have a special guest who has truly redefined the hunting industry. He started bow hunting at 16, became a fly fishing guide at 19, and founded Wild TV 20 years ago, providing a platform for hunters to share content and manufacturers to grow the sport in Canada. He's the youngest Canadian host who have a show on the US Outdoor Channel, with 20 years of hosting experience on shows like Outdoor Live and The Edge. As the owner of Recoil Productions, he creates over 50 shows a year, capturing the essence of the hunt. He's a lifetime member of organizations like... Pope and Young, Wild Sheep, the Alberta Bow Hunter Society, with hunting adventures spanning Canada, Russia, Alaska, and beyond. Welcome to the Silver Core Podcast, Ryan Kohler. Cool. That was awesome. <laughs> I thought that was really I, good. I, I got to it in one take. <laughs> eh? There you go. No, that's great. It's so weird to hear all that stuff, but um, yeah, really cool. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Travis. This is going to be Yeah. Fun. Well, we've been chatting for a while back and forth. It's nice to finally be able to sit down and do this and- you're in your beautiful production studio there, and uh, I love the fact that you have all the same uh, same drama and headaches and everything that I do whenever I get on. I'm getting the cameras rolling and the switchers and the microphones, and I'm uh, yeah, it feels yeah. good. Feels good to know I'm not alone. You know what? You got to have everything right, right? I, I think we we tried our best to make it uh, good quality for you and have a little bit of a background and a mic and everything else. So. What else can you do except for try that's your best? perfect. So bow hunting at 16, that's where you kind of cut your teeth, is it, with the bow? Um, yeah, if you want to if you wanna look at it that way, um, the whole, like all of Wild TV and everything I've done, it's all started from the Edmonton Bow Zone and hunting with archery equipment in the Edmonton Bow Zone and being 16 years old and seeing, you know, I had a, uh, a couple of friends that got me into bow hunting. I, I My family actually... They don't hunt or fish or anything. So uh, my best friend's dad was a PH from Africa, mm. so he actually taught us how to hunt. So when we were little kids, we got a, a really good education. And, you know, I remember get my red station wagon, 1980 red station wagon, and, and piling into it and finding enough money for gas just to get out into the Emerson Bow Zone and drive, you know, 10 minutes into, into this area that had an unbelievable – world-class whitetail in it and we would go in the bush and we would have no idea what we were doing really and instead of you know partying like crazy in 16 17 18 on weekends I spent a lot of my time um you know waking up early in the morning and getting out in the dark and sitting in the stand for an hour and trying to figure out how to hunt giant whitetails and that that alone like that passion alone I would say if it wasn't for the whitetail deer I don't think wild tv would be here at all really or anything we've done really to be honest yeah well 100 percent, and that's what brings me back to to that place every year. Um, I live there, you know, my heart's in the hills in the Edmonton Bow Zone. Um, and we've, we've recently, like, I guess we're on season five now for, for Bow Zone Live, mm. that television program, like I, I made it like four or five years ago now, but it was the first program I really wanted to make when we first started because Drury Outdoors had this awesome show and Realtree Outdoors had this awesome, these awesome, well, actually it was Realtree Outdoors on TNN, that was the first time Canadians had Canadian TV. I don't know if you remember that far back, but <laughs> that was um, when we watched Real Tree in the morning or Bushnell Secrets of the Hunt and stuff like that was on. And and that was just so cool. And they had a team of hunters that would like work together mm-hmm. and they would hunt together. So that, that was the original uh, bit of production that I really wanted to do, but I, I just didn't have – the know-how or the knowledge or the connections or the relationships with manufacturers and all these pieces that took me basically, you know, 15 years or eight, whatever it is, 15, 18 years before we started Boson Live. So it's kind of like I had this plan for this show at the very beginning, but I never got to do it until, you know, until four or five years ago. So it's, that's a funny one actually, that, that that's how it worked well, out. Well, what planted that seed to have that plan? 
Um, well, like I said, like the white-tailed deer at the very beginning, I think that was really what planted the seed. I started, I had a television show on the Outdoor Channel. I was a, it was a fly fishing and bow hunting show uh, 22 years ago. And we were, I was the youngest guy on the Outdoor Channel. We mm. had that show for a couple of years. And we started learning how to, you know, sell manufacturers, which is the biggest piece, right, is, is getting uh, the manufacturers to support you. And then bringing that back into Canada, we got the license mm. through the CRTC for, this, for the station. And then it all kind of evolved from there. But if you go back to, you know, Bozone Live, the show we have right now, which is, is amazing, mm. an unbelievable live show. Um, there's nothing like it. Uh, that, like that's, like I said, the original show that I wanted to make, but couldn't, couldn't, we had to do all these other pieces of the pyramid before we could get to a place where we could do that show comfortably. Because if, to me, it was so special to make that show. It had to be, it had to be just perfect with the right people <laughs> and people had to have the right education in the Edmonton bow zone. It's like, it's like hunting in the Bermuda triangle. It's the weirdest place in the world to bow hunt whitetails. I think it's one of the hardest places in the world to bow hunt whitetails. Why is that? And, um. Well, you've got, you know, animals that live in, in, in and around subdivisions, uh, permissions really hard to mm. get. These animals are dark to dark. You know, there are a lot of luck, a lot of like nocturnal type of activity that you see just like any other area, but, um, you've got the cool temperatures that kick in. So you might be hunting in minus 15 to minus 30, depending on what the weather's going to do. Mm. And then they're really, they're really wild, right? Like they're really smart. They're picking up on scent. They're picking up on everything that a, a normal whitetail would, would pick up on if you're hunting in different provinces. But I think that uh, the pressure that people put on the area, it makes them a little smarter. I, mm. I mean, I'll even say this. I would say this, like in the last little while, I think that the mature whitetails in the Edmonton Boson, they've figured out the cameras. Like I'm yeah, quite certain of I it. think so. They've figured a hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. The smart ones... You get you get one shot. They get a picture. You get a picture, and you see a red light, or something happens to that camera, even a noise, mm. and it's twenty yards this way or forty yards that way. They ne they just don't use it again. I, I you get dumb ones. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you will get a dumb one every once in a while, and, so, and you'll get lucky. But the the really sharp ones, they can they they're picking up on all sorts of stuff. As we evolve with the technology, I, I truly believe they are too. So interesting. <laughs> it's pretty. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you'd have to. Well, that's one of these thing things. Filming one of these shows that I guess a lot of people probably don't consider as you're going all stealthy and going through there, you've got a camera person with you. You've got, uh, maybe audio people, maybe a crew of people with you all tromps and through, and everyone's going to have to be quiet. Like that's, that's gotta be a, a difficult dynamic to manage. So with how to hunt the, the other show, like I, I personally don't always have a cameraman mm. because it makes it harder. So with How to Hunt, I have a I have Corey Cook that I work with, and we will film each other because we're trying to, for whatever reason, like we've tackled some of the hardest hunts to film. Like for a good ex a good example is an Alberta elk hunt mm. in the deep timber with a bow. Like it's yeah. it's you can kill like guys can shoot elk all over the place, and and it's a it's a fun hunt, and it's high level of difficulty to shoot an elk with any, with any weapon, but for whatever reason, <laughs> like these, this deep timber elk, like you can only see 30, 40 yards in front of you where you can maybe shoot arrows through areas and you've got to have everything perfect. And so we're filming each other. We don't have a cameraman in that, in that sense. We might bring a cameraman in for a couple days to get shots of the manufacturer's products or shots of us just, you know, storyline shots where you're, you're filming part of the story for, for TV. But then when the hardcore hunt comes, we might have a guy there for one day, maybe two days. We, we could be there for 15 days or 20 mm. days and then we'll just have him leave and then they won't be there. And then for, uh, but that's, that's just for my, how to hunt show. If you look at the edge show with like Steve Eklund, Joe Pell, mm -hmm. like they have, like they have the most unbelievable camera guy that Greg Yelenitsky and he's just such an amazing human and his, his work is unbelievable the, the camera work and the edits and everything comes out of it. Like that's a different looking show mm. than how to hunt, mm -hmm. right? How to hunt is a little more raw. And then you have bows on live where I literally am 20 days alone. Like there is no camera guy. Like mm -hmm. they, that, that's why making that show is, is so difficult because you don't have camera guys. You have regular guys that I've found that live inside the Edmonton bow zone that literally cut their teeth. They do everything they can in their power to, 
to help make that show amazing. And they donate their time and it's 20 days or 30 days or even more really when you look at, when you start thinking, you know, early September scouting and all the way through October into pre-rut and then into, into November where they're, they're, they're hunting every day if they can, mm. you know, and, um, that's all done alone. So it's all done with camera arms. It's all done with GoPros and anything else you can get your hands on that films. Some guys have three or four different setups going and it's pretty cool to see what they can, what they come out with when they sent, when they hand in the cards for the day. So we'll hand in cards for the day. It'll go to the edit suite. We'll edit it and then bang, it's on the air for Boson Live. So it's, it's really unbelievable the way we do it. So what's the pressure like if you're, you got your own show and I, and things have evolved over time. Now we've got social media and there's pressure to be successful and you want to have, you, you don't want to have a show of somebody just walking around in the bush all by themselves the entire time, unless you're able to have a, a compelling story out of that. A lot of people would tune in because like traditionally the hunting show, they want to see the hunter be successful. What, what's that like to manage for stress level, for expectations, for the, uh, consumer, for the viewer? Um, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I can. Um, I think that when you first start into the hunting industry, whether you're, well, this is what it was, how it worked for me anyways. Like when you, when we first started doing it, I had a lot of pressure. I felt a lot of pressure where you had to, you know, get a kill for the show. Like I really mm. felt that. And then, um, as you, I, as you age, I suppose you get a little smarter and your hunting tactics get a lot better and your, um, the places you go, you know, you get smarter on the decision making on where you go and when you go. And I think that that levels up you as a, as a hunter, um, especially when you want to do well for the manufacturers and show that you've done a good job mm -hmm. and you want to get an ethical clean kill for the show. So I, I would say that pressure's off me a lot, a lot less than it was. Mm. So at the beginning, um, it was always, always, but we needed to kill, we needed to kill, we needed to kill. Now, I think the kills just kind of come because you're more prepared mm. and you're, you know where to go and you know what you're doing and it just, it changes. Mm. Like, I think that hunting as like a good example, we would be, I always like to say this, like outfitter guides, like they they hunt so much during a season, right? So if you're an, elf, an outfitter guide for elk, you're hunting like 30 days. And if you're not, you're hunting maybe a week or a weekend mm. every year for three weekends or something. And so you level up to a professional level pretty fast when you're doing shows because you're doing it every day like a guide or an outfitter. Or maybe you're with two or three guide and outfitters during the season. So so you're putting in just, just more time. And I think more time into the wild places like that when you're trying to, you know, you're going hunting and harvesting, then you're going to get better at it. Mm -hmm. So it's the pressure would be less, less pressure now than it would be when I was younger, for sure. I thought that was the key to everything, but really a good story will, will, will crush any, any kill at, yeah. at the end of the day, right? Good story, a good story, good characters, and you can do an unbelievable show. I was talking with Mark Kenyon about it and he says, you know, I tried going on that route. I tried, you know, it's, it's a clear path. If you want to be famous on Instagram and social media and you always got the hero shots and you're always making the successful hunt. And he says, but it wasn't me. And I wasn't being honest to myself. And he says, the second he started showing some of his failures and the second he started talking about the things that he was feeling close to his heart, um, all of a sudden, everything that he was trying to pursue by following this, this model of being the, the, the hero hunter was just coming naturally. And he says he got way more people interested and, in, and, um, wanting to learn more about what it was he did just by being sure. brutally honest about it. Yeah. I think people love it when I miss, right? Sure. Like it, it, when it goes to, when it comes to social media, I always look at your engagement. Mm. I think, I think that's the most important piece. So if I have whatever 15,000 followers, but my engagement's super high on all the posts, Perfect. like I find that there's way more value in that than just having if I have half a million followers, but nobody really talks to me or engages in the, in all the posts, then what do you really have? You don't really have anything. Right. So I know for sure, like if I, I have, there's a video of me missing this giant white tail at 20 yards and he ducks the arrow and it's in the snow and it's a beautiful scene. It's an unbelievable video and people love that. Mm -hmm. right? They love that. Right. They, any miss or any time, um, any, anything that happens in the video where there's a little bit of controversy or, or you miss mm -hmm. or you're, you're, you, know, you fall down the mountain and you're hurt or anything like that. That's real. I think people like, I think people even like it too. If you just, you wake up in the morning and you're showing them the 
that you're normal and you're having a coffee and a workout and your kids are going crazy or whatever mm. and you got to take them to hockey and it's, it's just you know everybody like the normal part of your life I think that's I think that's good too. Yeah, there's a relatability to it. You're not just some person that's out there. You're, you're somebody that, that you can relate to that uh, is doing the same thing that I'm doing. You feel in the same pains. How, where do you see, I mean, we're, we're watching things evolve. We're seeing shows like uh, Meat Eater in the States that took off like crazy and has uh, got, gotten a lot of eyes on, um, on hunting and fishing and outdoor pursuits. We're, where do you see the future of hunting in the social sphere kind of moving towards? Because at the same time, we're also seeing social media uh, giants like Meta clamping down on if there's a picture of a firearm in the photo or, um, or anything it deems to be politically unacceptable. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. I think Meta tried to shut me down yesterday, which is. For what? Because <laughs> I had bears. I think it was a bear hunt. Mm. Yeah, the bear hunts, they don't, they don't like the bear hunts. Most people are like, you know. I'm like, what's your favorite bear, polar bear, grizzly bear, black bear? And they say gummy bear, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> Sure. <laughs> but uh, if, if I was going to say where it's it's headed, I mean, I, uh, 100% to the apps. Um, the apps are pretty super powered right now. There's there's a few out there. And they're, they're going to be much better in the next couple of years. You're going to have apps that have all the content in them. It'll have social content in them. It'll have... Like your good example would be like your Onyx stuff in there. Mm. Like you'd, you'll have, you'll be able to put all your plots and everything. You'll be able to have weather inside them. You'll be able to load all your photos and communicate with other hunters through them. I think that um, they're on the way to a place where you have, you know, one, probably one single awesome hunting app and it's just, it's just super powered with everything in it. I think that's kind of where it's probably headed. Interesting. You know, yeah. Yeah. That it, it would be interesting. The amount of apps that we have that are kind of dominating, like you talk about on X or iHunter or like all these little tools that people start bringing out. I'm wondering if there's going to be a bit of a resurgence, um, away from technology. Like uh, you see more and more people wanting to go out and film and you see more people wanting to be on social media and show their fish or show their process. And, and there seems to be um, I wonder if that's going to get saturated and if people are going to want to find a, a different way to get mentorship. Like, is there a way to blend technology with boots on the ground, uh, mentorship that you could see? Because that, that would be where I would see a, a, a real need, a real need for people. Cause the hardest thing for those following you if they're brand new is they want to learn, they want to see how you do it. And maybe it's going to be a little different in your area. Um, yeah. I, I don't yeah. Well, you can only hope, you can only hope, right? Like for, for me personally, I mean, we'd like to take the phones and put them in a plastic bag and chuck them in the river, like, and then get people outside learning on how to do the wild things either on their own or, I mean, I don't know if technology, like that's a good question to be honest, because, like with my kids, I can just talk about my kids, I suppose, is, is like, I like to take them shed hunting. I like to teach them how to hunt. They're athletes. They're on their phones enough mm. where, you know, it's, it's harder for me to get them to do these things and to learn the way that I, I learned, which was like, just really a wild way, like chuck, chuck them in the pool and, and have them learn. Mm. Right. If people are trying to, to learn today through technology and getting to low, getting to under to know like the tips that I have and, or say like any of the unbelievably super incredibly smart hunters that are across Alberta and all across Canada, which there's a lot, mm. right? There's some really, really educated, super smart guys out there. Um, you know, I think that like, you know, you're still going to video, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or whether it's an app. Um, and like I said before, I, I think it's all going to come together. Mm. I think it's all going to be pulled together into one place. I think that's where it's, it's headed. Cause right now it's so segmented, right? There's all this stuff all over. Mm. And so, and, and that's, I think like that's, the point that, the point that I guess we're trying to make with our app is our app has got 20 years of content and it. it's our 20th anniversary right now. We've got 20 years of video in there that you can look back on. We've got a lot of opportunity to put like live in there. Our streaming live is, is in there, but in the back end behind the scenes, like we're working on building exactly what I said to you. We're working on building something that you can pull anything into. So whether it's your podcast or whether it's, 
it's like the Onyx app, having everything inside one, one place for people to go and educate themselves. Mm. So I, I do know that it's tough to get the education in the wild. Um, and I think that I touched on it a little bit earlier. I, I, unfortunately, like I really truly believe that it's time spent. Yes. And no matter how much video you watch, no matter how many podcasts you listen to, no matter, no matter how much YouTube you do, um, like you're, you're not going to beat, you know, three weeks in elk camp. You just, you just can't do mm -hmm. it. That, that's why dragging the kids out there, I think is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that they're out in the wild and, and learning those things. So, so I guess my answer would be, um, you can't beat the real thing and the real thing trumps all and more time in the real thing is really going to be how you get the most knowledge for, for any, anything. I think at the end of the day, right. Putting in your time, your 10,000 reps, I suppose. Yeah, right? I agree with you. It comes down, it, it comes down to that. For me, it does anyway, because I felt a real change. I feel like, I feel like there had, there's a real change in, in the way I hunt and the way I think and the way I do things over time. Like I think time really makes you a better outdoorsman at the end of the day. You, you become smarter and better at what you're doing, just like anything else, I suppose. Now you can't fast track this process. This is something that time is the process of learning happens over a long period of time. And, but there's always that common question. Let's pretend for a second that you could fast track that process. If you were to look back at young Ryan, what are some tips that you would uh, turn around and, and give him? Maybe save some pain and heartache. I don't know. I think you have to go through the pain and the heartache, man. I don't think you can see, I think there's an arcing, a hunt, a hunt arc, right? So I think you start, um, you know, where you're, you're kind of hunting everything. Like you get your, your bow, your rifle, and it's like, I'm going to shoot every squirrel, every porcupine, every deer, everything, mm -hmm. everything, everything, everything. And then, and then you kind of go, uh, okay, I'm going to be selective and I'm going to start shooting Pope and Young's or I'm going to try to get, you know, animals that are big enough where I can feel like I got a awesome trophy or, or maybe a big enough moose because mm -hmm. it's got lots of meat or mm -hmm. whatever kind of turns your crank. And then, and then I think you get to a point where you're like, I'm only going to shoot the perfect thing. Mm. And so you shoot a lot less things and then you go full circle. You go, I got to get somebody else. And maybe it's his son or maybe it's a nephew and I'm going to take them out for the first time. And then you get to relive, like, I'm going to shoot every squirrel <laughs> and every porcupine and every deer. And so I think there's like, there's an, an arc to hunting where you're kind of in this little circle I, I found. Um, but as far as telling myself, giving myself tips, I think be patient would be the biggest thing would be slow down, be patient, pay attention a little more. Um, don't sweat it. Don't start overthinking everything. I think, mm. um, over, overthinking is probably the, the worst thing you can do. Thoughts aren't thinking. That's, that's a Joel Turner mm -hmm. uh, quote, actually. He's I had him up in the Edmonton Bozone and uh, he was just on the Joe Rogan show actually. And he's an unbelievable guy and thoughts aren't thinking was the coolest thing he said to me. So I'd, I'd say that to myself for thoughts sure. Aren't thinking. Slow down the, slow down the thinking. Yeah. Because what are thoughts, right? Most of the time they're just bouncing around in there like crazy and they're not doing you that much good. So yeah. maybe start with the, the, the thinking and the, the, the truth. Thoughts aren't thinking. I like that <laughs> one. I'm going to use that one. So, you know, you're saying recently almost got shut down by Meta for being on a bear hunt. I can only imagine in your industry and what you're doing that this is an ongoing process that you're always having to navigate the uh, restrictions or people logging in and saying, how could you, you're going to have people who are behind you and support you and you're going to have, you know, the bigger you get, you're going to have both sides on there. How, how are you finding the, um, the haters dealing with the haters and dealing with the, uh, you know social what? influence? We, we really don't get much. Like it's not, it's not what you would think. Um, uh, the, the only time we get a little bit of backlash would be if, if I turn the channel onto a free view. So like it's free for everyone right across Canada mm -hmm. on Bell and Star Choice and TELUS and sorry, not Star Choice, Shaw Direct and Rogers and everything else. That's old, that's old school, <laughs> that one. But, um, yeah, then you'd have everybody turning it on. And, and if we get, say, like an African safari hunt and mm. somebody thumps an elephant, then, yeah, I'll probably get some emails. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I think Canadians are pretty good, like, to be honest with you. Like, I think most Canadians are pretty good with the fact that hunting is part of our heritage. It's part of our lifestyle. And, you know, farmers everywhere do it. And lots of people do it. You can be a – I don't know if you're, whether a, you're a doctor or whether you're, you know, you're on your own – 
chiropractic clinic mm-hmm. or, you know, you could have all these other titled people that may, that, that hunt as well. Right. Like I know one of my, like my doctor, he's a, he's a big time hunter. He's an awesome guy and great human and, and hockey players too. Right. Like I, we actually take, I've taken quite a few NHLers. So there's people from all different walks of life that hunt. And I think Canadians, I think Canadians know that I don't get too much backlash unless we do something that's, I mean, if you do something, I suppose, illegal, mm. then we're, we're in a different conversation, right? Then, then I think that, um, you're probably done. Like that's kind of where that goes. It goes to, to, we, we take you off the network completely. Um, we don't associate with it and we just say that's kind of the end of the line. So I think that's probably where you'd get some, some hate that, and that happens pretty fast. That, that comes from every place. Well, you're a hunting network. You're not a poaching network. So th- th- and that's the thing, you know, people say, oh, look at these hunters and what they did. They did this illegal thing or they did that illegal thing. Well, no, no, those are poachers. Those aren't hunters. If they're doing things unlawfully, intentionally, that's poaching. So yeah, that, there's a zero tolerance yeah. for that. Yeah. O- otherwise, yeah, we don't, we don't get much. Like I really, any, to be honest, well, like I don't get, I don't, I don't see it. Maybe one or two a year where people send something in that's telling us we're nuts, but well, that that's it. precludes I one of the questions it. that came up from one of our uh, club members. They wanted to know how you guys deal with criticism and misconceptions about hunting. But if you're not really getting that much criticism, maybe misconceptions. No, no, it's, I think it's the opposite. Really. People are asking us how to do it, where to do it, when to do it. You know, how do you do everything from draws to where do you go to get permission or how do you hunt a moose? And I don't, we don't get too much hate. It's just not there. So if they, we get if, love. They, if they have these kind of questions, they just reach out to you and you're the guy responding or your, your crew there are, or what's, how's that work? Yeah, I can. I'm, I'm pretty easy to get, um, my email. You could probably find it on the internet pretty <laughs> easy or, or at Ryan T. Kohler on Instagram. Mm-hmm. You can get me and ask me any question anytime, anytime you want. I'm, I answer every question a hundred percent for sure. Mm-hmm. And if it comes in through the, through the station, then, um, Unless there's somebody that's better equipped to answer it than me, then they would answer it. But if, if it's something that I can help and answer with, I'm happy to answer it. Like we're happy to, we're happy to help grow everything too, right? Like if there's someone that's a producer that's filming that wants to, you know, try to grow a bigger brand and get on TV, then, you know, especially Canadians, like we're really, really, um, proactive trying to help them get that that vision on, on television. Cause I think that's the best part of our network is we're a, little, we're a little bit different than all the other networks in the sense that we have a lot of Canadian content, a lot of Canadians trying to bring you Canadian TV. And what do you relate more to if I'm living in Alberta and I see a Alberta whitetail show? I love it. Mm. Right. And if you're in, if you're in, um, New Brunswick or, or Newfoundland and you see a moose show and then the Tuckamore, like you love mm-hmm. it. Right. So I think that people relate to what they can, they can access and that's, really important to us and really important to us to bring to the viewers. So Canadians are the shit, man. I want to have as many Canadians as we can making content and bring it to the network. It's, it's so important and it makes us different too. I, we're different, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're not American. We don't mm-hmm. speak and talk and look American. We speak and talk and look <laughs> Canadian. So why not just stick with hey, that? buddy, hey guy, um, yeah. you know, self park Canadians. Um, so some of the people listening to this are going to be individuals who want to get into the content creation, uh, industry, what would you be looking for in an ideal person that you'd want to be having showcased through, uh, through your place? Oh, and I, I don't think there's an ideal person. Mm. I would, I would say that doesn't exist. I would say the more unique and different you are is going to probably make you better right off the bat. Mm. Um, and whatever you're super passionate about should come through. And if, whether it's whether it's a species of animal or whether it's, um, something that you do in the wild, it could be, it could be, you know, like you have, you live in Northern Alberta and a, in a little home somewhere with your family and you're just surviving on wild things like on mushrooms Mm -hmm. and whatever else, like that, that to me is, is amazing and entertaining. Um, you could be an archer, an amazing archer or something like that. Like, I think that, that the scope is pretty, pretty, pretty broad. Mm. So you don't have to be an expert hunting guy. I think you just have to be someone that be passionate. Is, likes wild things. Yeah, be be pa- that that's the biggest thing. And and 
uh, if you're super passionate, I can give you a quick story about Steve Eklund because that's what he was like when he came in. Yeah. He, he came in the office because I used, I used to host The Edge and then I basically passed it to Steve and he ran with it and he's done unbelievable things. Mm-hmm. But when I first met him, he was, he was so passionate. I asked him what he wanted to you know, be and do and he's like, I'm going to be the next Jim Shockey. Without like flinching, and you're, you're, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody can be Jim Shockey. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Nobody will ever be Jim Shockey. But he was so passionate and he was so intense about his answer that I knew as soon as he answered me that way, I'm like, this guy's not joking. Like he's actually, he actually thinks he can do it. And so Fantastic. you get behind that. Yeah, you get behind that, yeah. right? That's something you get behind. So when somebody calls and they're passionate about, whatever it might be, whether it's a species or, or a fishing thing, or it can be, um, you know, just woodworking or something mm. or chainsawing animals into little crafts or something like just, that's all you need is, is a real passion. And then obviously you're going to need, you know, some sponsorship and that'll be the business side where you have to get into the business side. So that's the, that's probably the toughest piece of the puzzle, the hardest part to crack because sponsorship, most people have no idea how to get into that, where to start, what the value is of what it is that they're providing. Um, it's gotta be something that you probably struggle with still to this day is, uh, uh, is that, but I'm sure you've got sort of the large brush strokes kind of figured out. How do, how do, how do people look at approaching that? What would you suggest? Well, I think there's two ways to do it. There's the old school way, you pick up the phone and just start working, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, that's at the, at the end of the day, it's a sales job. You're selling yourself. You're selling your passion. You're selling what you love. You got to be able to grind it mm-hmm. out like anything else. You just got to do the work. That that would be that'd be the the answer, okay. really. Grind at the end of out. the day, you can go through. You just got to you got to grind it out. You got to do the work, and it might take a year. It might take two years. You just don't give up, and you keep working at it. That that's that is the answer at the end of the day. But I think that today, because of social media, you can prove that passion on let's say an Instagram account account or a TikTok account mm. and that will help you in those in those calls I think I think if you're if you're truly passionate enough about something you're going to make truly unique content on social and that truly unique content will hit an algorithm mm. and that will help you get started I, I I believe in that I think that would be something that you would you know if I had to start over and I had nothing, that's, I would start, I would start somewhere in, in those places mm-hmm. and then build that up. And I'd have to have something unique wow. and different. And, and then from there you could, you know, start trying to sell yourself. You're essentially selling yourself in that se- or your idea or, or your story. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, but it's like anything else. I mean, if you want to be a marathon runner, you're going to have to run a lot, mm-hmm. right? You're going to have to work hard. If you want to be a hockey player, like you're going to have to work hard at it every single day and you're going to have to find every way to, to be different. And you're going to have to, um, work behind the scenes when no one's watching and, and just kick ass along the way. And I, that's, that's it. It's like, it's just, it's good old hard work, man. I agree. You know, the people that I see that are successful in what they do in seeking out sponsorship or being able to live a lifestyle where they can, uh, afford what it is they need in order to be able to get by and still do the thing that they're extremely passionate about. None of these people start out that I'd seen start out saying, okay, so I need X amount of money and here's the sponsors. I'll just keep looking for one that fits a bill. And then I'll, I'll kind of work my way backwards from that. I've, I've never seen it work that way. Maybe it does. The ones that I've seen successful are the ones that work from, I'm passionate about it. And I would do this, whether you're paying me or not. And they're selective about the people that they'd want to work with. And it's a relationship. And that relationship I found is easier to start if both parties have skin in the game. Not a problem. You don't have to pay me anything. How about you just loan me some kit and I'll use it for a few things. And I'll, I'll, I'll use it. And if I'm happy with it, I'll tell other people about it. And you'll see kind of if that's worthwhile to you or not. And I found that approach to sponsorship, um, a, a way more effective way. Uh, I, 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 I agree. I guess like our origin story is sort of along those lines too. Um, you know, when I started wild TV, I was working in an unfinished basement in Calgary sleeping on, on a sleeping bag on a shitty old bed 
and with a poker table full of like all the TV shows <laughs> on the poker table. We had no staff. We didn't know really how to do much except for make one TV show that we had made for the Outdoor Channel. And then, um, did you still have the, we got the license. Did you still have the station wagon? Sorry. Uh, no, I, <laughs> oh man, the car, the car I had then, if I remember the name of it, it was this little, I can't believe it ran. The oil was like <laughs> spitting out of the tail of the, 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 of that thing, like constantly on a daily basis. I was working for an advertising agency. So selling ads, um, but doing this on the side and then, um, I met a guy by the name of Scott Sterling who still works for mm -hmm. us and I gave him a pair of sheds. I traded him a pair of sheds yeah. to build me a website. So he built the first wild TV website with a pair yeah. of sheds and then we started working on it and I had, uh, we built these servers. We put all the content in these servers and then we went to Saskatchewan access communications to launch wild TV for the first time. But we had no idea what we were doing. We had a, a camper. We went there and Scott walked in and plugged this thing into their big head end and tried to make it work. And <laughs> we sat there for 15 minutes going like, I have no, you have no idea how to do this. But, I could literally but, picture like, Scott we doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really funny. He was sweating bullets <laughs> and he's just pressing buttons. Not a clue. But we worked for a couple of years before, you know, uh, we ever got to that point and we worked for a couple of years just selling commercials like for a dollar the first shot show i went to i slept in the basement of the flamingo because we couldn't like we couldn't afford the room how do you sleep in so the basement of the flamingo they have these super shitty they had these crazy rooms down yeah. there where they were like really cheap rooms and like me and scott and a couple other guys were all in this one room like i slept on the floor <laughs> of the hotel at my first shot show i think i've done like 13 or 14 shot mm. shows and that was the first yeah. one. And then we, we, um, and then when I was there, like, like the first couple of years, like I would tell people about wild TV at like a Edmonton Bolton sportsman show. And they would say like, no way, mm. like you're crazy. There's no way you can do mm. this. And I'd say the name and they'd be like, that's a terrible name. Like I remember <laughs> the people specifically that told I'm me, sure I still you remember do. today, like, oh yeah. And I remember, um, you know, the network saying like hunting on TV, like no way. Like Shaw, no way. Mm. Like tell us, no way. Like you know, Bell Express. These guys are like, no chance. This is we're never putting a moose kill on TV. Like so, we had a couple of years of, of real challenges where we had to grind it out. Right, you had to work really hard and grind it out. Mm. And um, I remember the year I was at the Shot Show and I slept on the basement floor. Uh, <laughs> a, a guy by the name of Bob Walker. He used to own Walker's Game Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like 19, 18, 18 years ago, probably, and. Basically, he was like the gangster, like of the hunting mm. industry. He he was the sh he was the shit. Like he he knew every single player. He was he was big time. Mm -hmm. he, he really was like a gangster to me. Yeah. Anyways. And so when I was there, I was this young guy. I was really had tons of energy. I'd I'd go to every single booth. Like my feet would be bleeding because. Mm -hmm. If you've been to SHOT Show and you try to go to all the booths, like you're running everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, I literally had bleeding feet. Like I'm, that's not even a joke. And, um, and, but he, he, I was really lucky with him because when I told him our story about Canada and bringing all these shows to Canada and bringing all the manufacturers to Canada through the station, like he really believed in mm. it. And so, um, he actually, he actually took me from booth to booth. So he like put me under his arm and walked me to all the top players mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, let me introduce you my friend Ryan. This is my friend Ryan. He's got this idea for this thing in Canada. And so he like really introduced mm -hmm. me to a lot of the top manufacturers 18 or 20 years ago. And that that was that was key. Totally. <laughs> that was really, really helpful. And then and another guy that was really key would have been, I mean, Jim Shock, mm -hmm. right? Like Jim Shock, he put when I called him the first time, and he still wasn't Jim Shockey. Like, you know, he was 20 years ago, Jim Shockey. So he, like he was selling DVDs and <laughs> And, uh, and I said, like, I'm going to do this. And, and he was like, I'm all in, I'm going to send you everything I got, just go. And so like every, I had all the tapes of his and it was just like this crazy pile of tapes. Mm. And then we started putting it into the schedule and building it up. And, and Jim was help, really helpful that way. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but there was so many people that helped, uh, create it and put it together. My brother worked day and night on the back end, like the, the, putting content in and like, I think he worked for three months without like eating. And then, <laughs> and then my dad would do, um, 
would do like the high end like carriage deals with the Shaw and Bell, mm. and that's and then eventually I would take all that kind of over. But um, yeah, we had many years like we sold. I was saying like we sold commercials for a dollar at the very beginning. Like it was a buck, mm. one dollar. And why? So, to tell me why you did it for a dollar. I think I know why you did it for a dollar, but you tell me. Well, just because we just wanted to get a business. Right. Like we were at Shot Show, and and you got to remember too. Um, like I would work 16 hours a day and it wouldn't phase me ever because it was always exciting for me the whole time. Like if I'm going and I'm going to go meet like the guys at Primos, mm. like I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I'm so pumped. Mm -hmm. Like I'm freaking out. Mm -hmm. I'm meeting the Bushnell people, Primos. I'm meeting um, like the Realtree guys at first, like Bill Jordan. Like I'm, I'm meeting all these hunting manufacturers like Hornady. Like, and I'm, I'm like, I'm freaking mm. out. Like I'm scared. I'm pumped. <laughs> I can't believe I'm talking to them. Like it's all totally unbelievable. So for me, it wasn't that hard because it was so much fun and I could work like 12 hours, 16 hours a day and it would never be like work. Mm. So if I had a competitor, if I had a competitor mm -hmm. that, that was doing the same thing and, you know, they'd come home after eight hours and be like, oh, I worked so hard today. Like I would just crush that competitor totally. because it was, it was never like work, if that makes oh, sense. It totally right? makes sense. It's the, the guy who's running races, right? Because he wants to get medals. Right? Maybe a better story would be, um, uh, what was it? Uh, the Wright brothers. You've heard the stories of the Wright brothers, how they, um, uh, Wilbur and what is it? Jonathan Wright, who flew the first plane, right? Yeah, I know. The, I know they got the planes going. Right. So what did they have? They had a bicycle factory and they're playing around with different designs, trying to make these things fly and spending every dime that they had. And they had a real passion for it. But at the same time, the government, the uh, U.S. government had top researchers and engineers and there's a bunch of money by the time there's one group and this one individual in particular to go out and make a plane, make something that can fly. Sure. And it didn't matter how much money they threw at it. it they, this guy wasn't able to be the first person to have, to make a plane. And the second that the Wright brothers got the plane up and going, he quit. He's, he's not interested anymore. And the reason the Wright brothers are able to do it is because they had a passion for it and they'd be doing this and they mm -hmm. were doing it despite the fact they weren't getting money for it. The person who loves to do yeah, what it yeah. is that they're doing will always outperform the person who's doing it for the end result. Yeah. I, I believe in that a hundred percent. I mean, a hundred percent, like, it, like with the same, it goes hand in hand with like the bow zone back to that show and hunting whitetails. Like I will literally scout 16 hours a day. I will, I'll go in the truck, I'll drive around or I'll, I'll walk rub lines or I'll, I'll do a million different crazy things just so much more that I think most people are even like willing to do, or maybe they can't even do it. They don't have the time they'd like to, but maybe they don't like, I think putting in that time and energy, that's what makes it, uh, the success at the end of the road, a little easier, maybe, mm. I guess like, it's just, just, I can just do more. I'm just a psycho that way. I just get, I like full ADHD. Well, I was going to bring <laughs> that up. I mean, you mentioned it before, <laughs> before we got on here. I know a thing or two about that. You know? Yeah. Was, yeah. If you're like, if you're, I just high hyper focus on things, mm. right? So, and like competitive, I, it's, it's in my bloodstream. So as soon as, as soon as there's some competition, like I really, I really wake up. Mm. If things, if, if there isn't competition or if something, someone's not attacking me in some way and the business is just going smoothly, like I fall asleep. I agree. But as soon as, I agree. As soon as there's, as soon as there's chaos, you know, I, I like to say that there's opportunity in chaos, always opportunity in chaos. And I really get going, I really get going for competition. Mm -hmm. Like when Sportsman's Canada came into Canada, in, into Canada, like I was like, let's go, let's go. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. And, and I, and I, I can honestly say at this point now that there's, there really is no competition. Like we have done such a good job to, to just absolutely crush the U S side. I can say that I'll, I'll say that without, without, without worrying about it because the, there's so many areas that we do such an unbelievable job in. and we do it for the producers on our network and the Canadians watching and every, everybody else that's part of, of the, of the network, I suppose. So, you know, and that that's, but that's where, that's where I get going. That's what fires me up. Like, give me some and, more. And you need that's that cool. competition. Yes. There is opportunity in, in chaos. I had one person say, I was like, how come I feel so comfortable when everything around me is falling apart, when everything is in chaos, 
I'm centered. I'm focused. I'm, this is where I feel most comfortable. And this person said, well, maybe it's because your outside environment's now matching your inside environment. What's going on in your head? Yeah, that's a good right one. On. I like I thought, that. Huh, okay. Maybe. And they said, maybe you should work on calming down the inside environment so you can feel that same sort of comfort <laughs> without everything having to be falling. Yeah, yeah. All the wheels that, falling off. That goes back to, to thoughts aren't thinking. Thoughts right? aren't that thinking. That's right. And that's, that actually works so well in shooting mm. because that's his, that's one of his, I mean, for me, um, I learned so much from, from Joel on how to shoot mm. better. And that was one of the things that really stuck with me, but that would be, this is a whole different podcast if you wanted to get into like this, the, the, the shooting stuff that I learned from Joel. But to give you an example, when he left, I was shooting a bare bow. So no sights, a compound bare bow with no sights. Mm -hmm. I was shooting a deer at 40 yards, like in the eye, which I couldn't do no before. No kidding. <laughs> like, let me, let me get this. Like I, I can shoot. I'm not a 3D guy. I shoot animals for a living and, and I've practiced a lot mm. at that. So I think you do that enough. You get better sure. at it. Right. But, and then, but Joel Turner came and he, he is Wayne Gretzky. Of, of so shooting. what did he do? What did he, how did he flip that switch for you? Oh my God. Um, there's so much to it. He's got a, a course online. Um, it, for me, it would be in depth for me to try to give you the details on what he does on this podcast would be too hard. It's an, I, I would say you have to be able to know the difference between open loop and closed loop shooting and um, that you need to do some research on. Go listen to Joe Rogan's podcast with Joel Turner. He's going to tell you. Get onto any of the stuff that he's got on social media. He's going to tell you. Um I was an open loop shooter in the Edmonton bow zone because the environment that we hunt in is always, there's, there's a lot of chaos going mm. on and to try to have these animals sit still so you can shoot a closed loop shot. Closed loop basically is keeping that, that thought process on the target, I suppose, mm. and making sure that you're uh, doing like proper steps through the process mm. and you're not allowing those thoughts in because mm. those thoughts are what creates that target panic. Mm -hmm. And so you're just using the thinking part mm -hmm. to make sure that you do a perfect shot. So, um, yeah, that's a big question. And, and I'll be honest with you. I am not like, there's, there's so many good archers and good hunters. Like I was saying before mm -hmm. that I, I would say that I'm not like amazing at this. I, I work at it. I need to work at it more. And the more I work at it, the better I'm going to be. And Joel would probably give me a swack and say like, <laughs> it's either you do it or you don't because it's true. Mm -hmm. It's either you do it properly or you mm -hmm. don't. And if you're, if you're, if you're thinking through the process and you're, you're not doing us all their bullshit, then you're probably going to send a perfect shot or a perfect arrow every time. So it's, uh, if you're into it, I would say, look up, um, look up Joel. It's amazing. It's life changing. If you have any kind of a target panic or you have a anything that, um, whatever you want to call it, or you, you hit the trigger or you, 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 your heartbeat goes through your chest and, and you have, you get panicked out when, you know, a big moose is coming in, mm -hmm. then I would say that there's nothing better than his program. It's, it's the best on earth. Yeah. For sure. 100%. The only thing that you could do that would be close is like I was saying before, what I do, which is just time. Mm -hmm. Like I could shoot a big bull moose, no problem, anytime. I believe I know I can, like, mm -hmm. and I'll smoke them because I've shot a bull moose every year for like, I don't know, for 20 years, like yeah, but, something like but there's that. There's that old like, saying, right? Is practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. So time in doing something sure. in an imperfect way, just further ingrains perhaps, uh, negative traits. Oh yeah, for sure. So when I, when Joel came here, I had what you would call just an ugly golf mm. swing, but I was good at it. Like, <laughs> but you could do it. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, I could yeah. do it. You know, I trained myself to have this ugly archery technique, mm. but like, I'll tell you what, like I could do it over time, but, um, but yeah, you're right. There, there's a, there's a better way to do it. There's a smarter way to do well, it. I, and, um, I'm going to have to check out that stuff by Joel there. Cause that sounds interesting. I like that a lot. Everyone talks about, you hear it, you'll hear it in hockey, you'll hear it in sports, you'll hear it in shooting. Oh, it's, it's 10% physical. It's 90% mental. And then all the coaches go out there and they focus on that 10% physical side. Oh, you got to stand like this and you got to hold it like that. 
that, uh, Ryan Stacy has been on the podcast a number of times and talking about mental marksmanship. He's a, uh, six, seven time national service rifle champion doing great things in the PRS game right now. Uh, Linda Miller and Keith Cunningham, they've been on the podcast. They wrote a book on mental marksmanship. That mental piece of the puzzle is absolutely game changing. And if Joel's got some, some cool thoughts and, and ideas on that, a hundred percent. Yeah. I'll, I'll be checking that one out. Oh, it's game. It is. It's life changing. It was for me, mm. for sure. It's, it's unbelievable. Cause you can, the stuff that he teaches. You can you. apply that to every aspect of your life. You can apply it to business. You can yep. apply it to. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's funny. We've like, he's applied it to like darts and pool. Sure. So he's training the top athletes in basketball and baseball. Mm. Like he's got really high level customers. And, uh, the one, the one he can't get though. And we're, cause we're trying. Cause I keep, cause I, I have a, a big hockey family and we've, we just, hockey is like most of my life is spent in an mm. arena. And, um, because hockey is chaos, <laughs> that's a tough, it's the toughest sport to figure out. And he's, to, he's been trying and trying and I've sent him all kinds of hockey IQ stuff and all this trying to get him plugged in where you can plug an athlete into this type of, of thinking. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's the hardest one. That, that hockey, Interesting. Man, it's, it's a tough one. You know, the other piece of the puzzle that you've alluded to, and you've said in here uh, for your business that I'm picking up and I've seen it in other businesses as well. It's not what you know, it's who, you know, so you've got the passion, you've got all the drive, you've got all this great, uh, effort that you're putting into it. But the second that, um, you were there with, uh, Mr. Walker, the gangster fellow taking you around, you've got somebody on the inside. And these connections that you make, they don't just happen by chance. Usually they happen because you're putting yourself out there and it takes time to build these relationships. People tell me, oh, Trav, it's not personal. It's just business. I disagree. Business is personal. It's based on relationships. It's based on trust, which takes time to establish. And I think that your passion that you had for what you're doing was contagious and it allowed you to make some of these connections, which allows you to get to the next level. My observation. That's true for sure. Yeah. I mean, getting to Bob was probably 500 phone calls in though. Like, sure. That might be the part I left out. Sure. Right? Like getting to talk to Bob Walker was not, not instant. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, I remember my little call sheets. Like I had these little <laughs> call sheets and I'd mark down the company and the phone number and like yes or no's and like comments and, and like I had lots of mm. them. So to get to that, to get to that spot where he walked me around, that was just the juicy part of the story sure. that I could give you. But the the tough part of the story would, would be the days and days of days and days of, of like making phone calls, like phone call, phone call, phone call, phone call, phone call. So yeah, it's just hard work at the end of the day, but the relationships you, you have, you have to get them, you need them. And the only way you're going to get them is just by not being afraid to step out outside the box and call someone yeah. and just talk about whatever you need to talk about to try to make a relationship. I don't even know if, I think it's hard for people to do these days where they're picking up the phone and not just going to their phone and texting or, yeah. you know, or going through social or writing an email. Like to me, um, there's nothing more personal than a phone call yeah. I mean, unless you want to write me a letter. If you want to write me a letter on a piece of paper with a pen, <laughs> I don't care what it says. I'm getting back to you. Totally. Like, I will get, no, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. Like I will get back to you. We actually had a guy write me a letter that was 40 I think he was 42 or 45 years old that had never written before. What? So he wrote, he wrote me his first letter. Did you frame that this? That was the first letter he wrote. Yeah. Oh yeah. We have it in the office downstairs. Awesome. hundred percent. It's, it's like super inspiring, right? He's like, I really wanted to write you a letter. I watch wild TV. I learned how to hunt watching wild TV growing up for the last 15 years. And I decided that I would go outside the box and make, and, 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 and like put myself out there because I was embarrassed. He couldn't write. Mm -hmm. Right. But he said, he's going to put himself out there and he wanted to send it to me. And, and it was like this totally crazy, inspiring <laughs> letter. That, I mean, it's unbelievable, <laughs> right? Like you get this letter and you're floored yeah. for yeah. one. You're like, I can't believe he wrote me a letter. <laughs> like, well, gosh. And then, and then you realize that, um, you know, he put himself out yeah. there, right? Like, and that's super important to be able to just step outside, put yourself out there. Every, like, what, did, what are people going to say? Like, you can't write. Like, I mean, that's, that's pretty wild. That's crazy. And so you gotta be, you just gotta be brave, right? You gotta be brave and, and just go for it sometimes. So yeah, I, that was I agree on the letter thing too. You know, we've got one individual belongs to the silver core club and he renews every year by check and we're like, we don't accept checks, but 
doesn't matter. This guy will <laughs> mail in a check and he always has a handwritten note and a letter. And then he does some political cartoons that he draws. And it's first time I got this thing and it had like cartoons and it was all handwritten and it was, um, I, I picked this thing up and I'm looking to see if there's anything leaking out of it. And do I want to open this letter up outside or what? <laughs> and, uh, oh, it turned yeah. out, That's uh, funny. nope, just, um, just a very passionate club member and, uh, and I save those letters too. You're right. It, it does stick. So meeting in person, oh, yeah, that's calling cool. up, doing a letter. Yeah. It makes a difference. Um, so another question we had from a club member, uh, he's new to Alberta and he's like, what are these bush bucks that all these Albertans are talking about? Why do they call them bush bucks? What is that term all about? Bush bucks. <laughs> bush bucks would probably be like your Northern... White, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, bush bucks are going to be your Northern, like Alberta whitetails that live in the bush that maybe never see a person. Okay. I, I think like we've got enough forest up here in, in Western and Northwestern Alberta that you could have, there's spots that whitetails live and I, I'm quite certain they can get up to 220, hmm. 40 inch whitetails that have never seen a person. So I'm guessing he's talking about those. I think they're pretty hard to hunt okay. because you, you know, if you're setting up your tree stand or I, I suppose a rifle hunt would probably be different. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't hunt bush bucks. I've, I've dabbled with them um, because they're enormous. Some, some places have enormous super giant mm-hmm. bush bucks. Not every, not, there's little pockets of genetics mm. in Alberta that have these like crazy deer. And um Yeah, they're just hard because if you set up on whatever, let's say you set up on a scrape or you find a really good ridge and you you set up on it and you see them on a camera once, that might be it. Like, Mm. it's just so big. Mm. The forest is so big that that might be it, that you might, you may never see it again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's been my experience with it is um, because it's so big and because they can travel up to, you know, five miles or whatever people want to say about whitetail traveling during the rut and even their core areas in a bigger area like that will probably be even bigger than what I'm used to. Um, it's just hard to catch up with mm. them. But I think when you do, they're, they're dumb as nails. Like I, I don't think they're, they're not that bright. Like they're going to be okay. way less educated. So if you have rattling horns or you have the right timing, you know, timing has to be good. Mm. Um, that's probably the most important part is timing. And then, and then any, t- any type of calling or anything like that, if he, if they hear it, like they're coming mm. because there's not anything else to come to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it's like, you know, a whale in the ocean. Mm-hmm. If there's one whaling over here, they'd be like, oh, let's go. Let's, let's, let's hang out. Right. So you, you got a big space of, of open timber and I'm not an expert on it though. I, I, I would say that there's probably more to it than that sure. for sure. There's probably, you know, Alberta outfitters that would be in that area that hunt that area that would have really good techniques to, to kill those deer. Um, I don't, pretend to know what they are. And like I said earlier, and I'll say it a million times, like I'm not the best hunter in the world. There's so many hunters that are way better. And there's so many that are good, especially in Alberta. There's different species, right? We've got Rocky Mountain sheep all the way down to antelope. Mm. So you've got this like giant expertise right across the board on all the species. And when you get into different species, you get into different, you learn more stuff, right? The the more you, the more you learn, the better you get, I guess. But So so your um, biggest thing that you're looking for is, well, number one, you just said timing. Timing would be one of the most important things for you. Timing for sure. And, and what are you looking for in that? Is there, do you also follow lunar phases? Are you looking for uh, uh, quick shifts in weather? Um, I would be proof of life first, mm-hmm. 100% proof of life. Yeah. I don't pretend to hunt anything. Mm-hmm. If I don't have proof of life on it, then no. Okay. I'm not guessing. Like I, 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 at this point, that's why I said, I think it makes a big difference between where you go, when you go, and you should know what you're going after. And if you don't, then you should at least have an idea that there's something mm-hmm. there. <laughs> so that's where your game cameras would come in. They help with proof of life. Um, or you're going to just, you know, scout and watch and, and drive around and cruise around and look like, I mean, whitetails are going to go mostly if they can, they're going to go to some type of food source, mm-hmm. right? Somewhere. So if you can watch that food source with spotting scope or binoculars, mm. then you should be able to get proof of life that way. Or, or, you know, if you have well-placed game cameras, I think game cameras are, are very tricky. Mm. I think you can take 60 game cameras and put them in a, a section of land mm. and you could have two big bucks that never get their picture. Mm. Like I, I think you could, there's 
I, I, I don't think that I actually, I know that mm. <laughs> because I've tried it. <laughs> so, um, I, you'd be amazed at, at, uh, at what is there that you don't know is mm. there. And that's why proof of life is important. And then it, not just proof of life, but proof of some type of travel route or some type of activity that like something they've done. And if you can't get it, like if you see an animal, then at least try to follow it through a, a scrape line or a rub line or, I think the information gathering is super important. If you can get information and you want a lot mm. of it, um, either you're, or you just get lucky, which is also mm. awesome because the experience with e either one is, I think, just as high quality. Like getting lucky is just amazing and doing all the work and killing something that you're after is, is, is different, but it's also just as equally mm. amazing or even just getting out and filling your freezer with meat. Like – they're all equally amazing to me. Not none of them is is a, is a, at, a, at a higher level than the other. At the end of the day, it's just where are you in that arc? I, I suppose. Funny. The harder I work, the luckier I get. Interesting how that works. Yeah. Eh? Ex ex yeah. That's that's it. Yeah. That's the that's the. Secret. So what what are some of the, <laughs> in your opinion, what are you seeing as some of the uh, more pressing challenges as well as opportunities that are facing our hunting community today? And would you have any thoughts on how we can address this? Uh, the challenges that are facing our hunting community today, um, well, I mean, you're always going to be faced with, you know, government changes on, on laws and regulations on whether they're putting down new regulations on sheep hunts or whether they're putting down regulations on a grizzly bear hunt in BC or this, some kind of CWD thing that mm. might happen with deer that are, like, I, I think you're, you're always going to be faced with the fact that like our industry is and our culture and what we do is like a grain of sand on mm -hmm. the beach. Like we're, we're, we're small. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have organizations like Wild Sheep Foundation, the Breeder Bull Hunters Associations right across Canada or like the SCIs and, and like these organizations that are helping fight um, against the laws and regulations that would stop us from doing what we love, then – you're, you're probably going to be in big trouble if you don't pay attention, mm -hmm. right? So our voice is loud if we speak up, but if we don't, then things can get taken mm -hmm. away, I think, especially as, you know, as our world changes and the way it's changing now with just the way different people like to live their lives and, you know, whether it's people living in a different country and looking in on what we're doing, like somebody in Europe in a building downtown and saying like, Hey, you're shooting a deer. You're mm -hmm. that that's brutal and bad. And, and everybody has their opinion, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to speak up for our culture, I think, and just be loud about it. Just be loud about it. Like, yeah, I like to shoot elk and eat the meat. Like, Hey, that's what I do. I'll, I'll eat the heart and blood will pour down my face with a big mm -hmm. smile. So <laughs> Be, be loud and be proud. <laughs> you don't like get used to it. Yeah, you should be loud and proud about it. Mm. I mean, it's just an amazing. Uh, the whole thing is amazing. Yeah. Like to be able to do it. In fact, that we can do it is is, is amazing. So, um, well, COVID seemed to present a, a massive opportunity for exposure for people wanting to be more connected with nature. And some people looked at hunting as a possible way for meat procurement, and probably didn't realize the amount of. Uh, effort and money and hard work that, uh, that is actually required, but it seemed to turn a lot of people on into foraging, hunting, fishing, outdoor pursuits. Had, did you find that from your perspective? Did you find, uh, shows viewership yep. spike? A hundred percent. Yep. A hundred percent. We had, uh, our viewership definitely spiked. Um, we had a lot of people paying attention. I think that I, like, I could just say that our industry is, is really growing all the time. Mm. Like from my point of view, from watching it from 20 years ago to now, like we have an, uh, we have a swim lane in our app that's for women, like the women, women in the outdoors. Mm. And they're, it's unbelievably awesome. Like it's mm -hmm. awesome. Like these women are amazing. And 20 years ago, you wouldn't have anyone. Like there was no one. Like maybe Vicky Cianciarillo, mm. like on, Arch, on Archer's Choice, like she was like the queen, right? But now we have a lot of women that are, that are in the industry. We have a lot of different cultures, I would say too. Like in Canada, there's different populations and different mm -hmm. cultures. And I think a lot of those cultures are starting to pick up on hunting and, and wanting to learn. And that's, that's cool. so it's, it, it is, it is growing. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's absolutely growing. I think paying attention to them is important, right? To everyone that wants to go hunting and fishing, no matter where you're from. Like it's, I think that's important. Um, but as far as COVID, uh, yeah, that huge, huge spike. And 
I think social media is driving it too. Like social's driving it. Um, and I, I don't know if I know enough about say the data or information from the hunters that have really are coming up and coming like the young hunters mm. on how far they're, they're taking the passion. I don't, I don't know that yet. I think that's something that's going to show up whether it's in content or like a podcast is a great mm-hmm. idea, right? Like, or a great example, like podcasts are popping up all over sure. the place and younger guys are getting into it and showing their passion through podcasts and through passion through um, any type of media on TikTok or like I said before, all social media platforms. So it's all grown, especially when you look back 20 years, like there was, like I said before, there was TNN. Yeah, that's a good point. I think Bushnell's, Bushnell's The Secret of the Hunt and, and, and Realtree, right? Like they had those two mm. shows. That's mm. it. And so there was no, there was no Cabela's, you know, there was no, there was no, um, there was the manufacturers in the U S they didn't really exist. They didn't come in here. Mm-hmm. Like people couldn't express themselves unless it was through a, an article in a magazine. That's a good point. That would be, that'd be it. Right. So we had big buck magazine for me. That was the biggest mm-hmm. thing. And then when you bring the network to Canada, then you had, you know, all these opportunities for everybody to put their stuff on the network and grow. And then manufacturers had an opportunity. And then we actually, we had a show called hunt fest. That was, a trade show and we brought Cabela's to it and that's why Cabela's came to Canada because we sold like six truckloads of gear out of our trade show out the back. Are you right? serious? And that that's why Cabela's yeah, is in Canada. A hundred percent. That's hundred percent. They, they tested the market through our our trade show, right? Mm. So we used to have Hunt Fest right across the board. And then um and yeah, that was just one of our clients and we convinced them to come in. I said, come on in here with all your stuff and we're going to sell it all. Good and for we did. you. We sold tons Good of it. Good for you. Yeah. Tons of it. Well, is there anything that we should be talking about that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I mean, obviously, um, we want to try to get people to, to look at the app that we have. I think we have an unbelievable app that we built last couple of years. We're building this app with hunters, like hunters, her hands on, on it. And it's got all 20 years. It's our 20th anniversary, mm-hmm. um, for wild TV, which is exciting and kind of unbelievable at the same time <laughs> that we've been doing it for that long. But the app, the app has all that content mm-hmm. in it. It's a super powered app and it, and it goes by province and each swim lane has specific animal species in there. So if you're like a whitetail guy, lives in Alberta, you can go straight after the whitetails in Alberta, all the shows for 20 years. Or if you're in BC and you like goat hunting, you can go watch all the shows that were shot in BC and just keep going on each genre like that all the way mm-hmm. through. Um, you, we've got the, the, the channel in it. Um, so the live streaming channel is available on the app. You can watch the live channel anytime on there. Of course, every, all platforms available on all platforms. And, and the thing is, is I think the, the coolest part is we're, we're going to do exactly what I talked about at the beginning mm-hmm. of the show is we're going to be bringing everything into one place. So we've built a really strong back end. We've got really excellent guys coding some of the coolest stuff. And the next, the next couple of years, you're going to see so many pieces, so many, I would say, I would, just, I would call it added value. So many things that we're going to add to this app that's going to make it like just unbelievably amazing for a hunter to have in the back pocket with not just the video, mm. but every other little thing that you'd want to have, whether it's moon phases, whether it's weather or whether it's, it's, it's a mapping, uh, uh, piece or whether it's access to all the podcasts or the live streaming channel, or maybe even a- other live streaming channels. It's, it's really kind of, um, it's really going to be something special. So we have over 10,000 shows in there right now. Our shows are coming up, you know, weekly, there's new content coming up. All the live stuff that we have, and like Bozone Live will be mm-hmm. inside it. We're going to be, ha- we have a show that's going to be uh, on their uh, Bear Week, kind of like Shark Week, but it'll be like Bear Week on Wild TV. And we're going to go live on Bear Week as well with some some of the Bozone Live crew. So it's just constantly evolving and um, it's going to get better and better as we go. Well, Ryan, we'll make sure to get links to all of that. So anybody listening to this and wants to see it for easy reference, we'll have it links in the podcast, links on the YouTube. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Silver Core podcast. I really enjoyed speaking with you and I've got my head spinning with a bunch of other questions that I want to ask you. I'll be asking them off air and might have to do a follow up to this episode. <laughs> thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, Travis. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I think these are so cool. So thanks for having me.